The twisted relationship between John Sunday, the machinist, and his creation Razor Mouth is one of the oldest and most complicated in this entire program. They've both grown and changed a lot over the years, and yet the bond they share stays as strong and toxic as ever. These two monsters have come a long way, but their journey is far from complete. Because their story has been spread out across so many episodes, I thought it might give you some clarity and a bit of insight to hear it run through in one telling. Drinking whiskey in the kitchen and telling scary stories around the fire. Music, monsters, and mayhem. Killers, cannibals, and cults. Fearful fiction and furious fact. Tall tales and terrifying truths. This is a scary home companion. From a very young age, John Sunday was courted by the cult called the One True Faith. Through their representative, Mr. Horrid, this cult guided John quietly for years, seeing, testing, if he was worthy of joining them. The boy had a natural aptitude for anatomy and an inborn enthusiasm for violence, which only strengthened as he got older. As a teenager, John was incarcerated for a substantial period of time, and this is when he met Michael. Michael was a weakling, a beta, a psychophant in search of a master. Michael was, in essence, John Sunday's first devout follower. It's unclear if there was any sexual relationship between these two, but Michael was slavishly devoted to his protector. John wasn't big, nor strong, but his cunning made him dangerous, and everybody knew it. There came a point when some of the other, rougher lads made a move on Michael in the showers. John Sunday saved Michael, ghoulishly overkilling the aggressors. Michael saw this as an act of love, but to John Sunday, it was just protecting what was his. Michael belonged to him. After the massacre, the one true faith took John Sunday out of solitary confinement and stepped up his training. He was learning how to be a predator. He was learning how to be the machinist. The one true faith had a deep lore, a mythology, and they believed John Sunday could be the new vessel for one of their founders, the machinist. John didn't know if any of that was true or not, but he was given full license to explore all of his darkest urges so he didn't ask questions. Eventually, the cult demanded that John step up his game. They demanded that he create a grotesque work of murderous art with which he could show his devotion and his level of skill. His masterwork was poor Michael, who was abducted and taken to John's machine shop. John spent weeks and months with his old friend, stripping away his humanity on the inside and the outside. He modified Michael's body, filing down the exposed bones of his fingertips into needle claws, giving him a forked tongue, taking away his sex organs. Michael's jaw was broken and rebroken, his cheeks cut, to pull his underbite out to a sickening degree, large enough to hold a custom-forged rack of razor teeth. 
All the while, John was using a constant barrage of brainwashing techniques. Between the pain and the manipulation, Michael's humanity was taken from him. He became the monster John had envisioned him to be. Razor Mouth, a post-human abomination, a warhound for its master. Using Razor Mouth as a weapon, as well as his own cunning, John Sunday slaughtered the ruling echelon of the one true faith. He claimed the throne for himself and stood tall as the leader of this old and powerful cult. Michael's name was already forgotten. He was only the monster now, the mascot for the one true faith, and the faithful enforcer for the machinist. John Sunday now had power, money, scores of servants, an entire world of horrors at his feet, and he reveled in it. He even took his machinist murders public, leaving grisly tableaus of elegantly mangled victims in major population centers. John Sunday was not satisfied with the adoration of his followers. He wanted the world to know and fear him. He was still young. He was drunk on power. But he was making far too much noise. He drew the full attention of the shadow agency called Deep Red Ops. did not want to try and take down the one true faith. They could do so, they had the resources, but it was not in their best interests to go to war. They offered a truce instead, blanket immunity for John Sunday, a permanent Code Crimson designation for the one true faith, which would make them entirely off-limits to other arms of law enforcement. John Sunday could keep doing whatever he wanted. But there were concessions. He could do whatever he wanted quietly. The machinist was now known far and wide. For the noise to die down, the machinist had to be caught, tried, and punished publicly, as would Razor Mouth. They couldn't die, they had to be imprisoned for the world to see. John Sunday agreed to this, for a couple of important reasons. He'd long been a student of body modification, ever since he was a kid. So as soon as he had the resources, John Sunday tried his hand at making other John Sundays. He would find someone about his skin tone, about his size, and give that man extensive reconstructive and cosmetic surgery. He would use those same brainwashing techniques that he used on Razor Mouth to chisel away at these men's psyches so they could take on a new persona. His persona. The DRO got exactly what they wanted. They got to apprehend the notorious machinist. They brought in a man who looked and sounded and even believed that he was John Sunday. The public got their closure. The machinist was locked away and the one true faith could continue unabated. Alas, Razormouth 
had to be sacrificed. There was just no other way. John Sunday couldn't make another one like him. Razormouth was lightning in a bottle, and John knew it. Besides, the way the other cultist had started to revere Razormouth was making John a little uncomfortable. Razormouth was a, a monster, a brute, a henchman, and nothing more. But Razormouth was now receiving more and more adoration, and over the course of months, it had started to change him. Almost like he was beginning to remember that he used to be a human being. It didn't affect John Sunday personally to turn Razor Mouth over to the authorities and see him locked away. It was a problem solved. On the other hand, he hated making any concessions to the DRO. It felt weak but for the greater good of the one true faith and his own personal convenience, he thought it was something he could live with. And up to a point, he was right. The monster was locked away. John Sunday went back to doing what he enjoyed, albeit a little more quietly now. He didn't need the distractions of the outside world anyway he had a thousand dark projects to work on. Razormouth gets locked up. There was a public arraignment, but not a real trial. What was the point, after all? It was like trying a wolverine or a snake. Razormouth was put into DRO custody and shipped around the country to various facilities so that everyone could have a nice, close look. This wasn't about punishment. This was about making sure the public was pacified. So it was basically a glorified promotional tour of the monster, letting everyone gawk for two bits of gander. Almost two years go by. There's no saying what was going through the head of the monster all this time. It's impossible to peek inside the thoughts of a creature so unknowable. He was studied, he was tested, he was kept in a very small cage. Eventually the tour was over and Razormouth was sent to a small asylum hidden in the hills near Grace, Michigan. The man who called himself the machinist was also there, as were a host of other notable maniacs and madmen. Gordo the Clown, Hog Farmer, Obadiah Moncrief, Miss Mercy, Emily Mason, Ben Burroughs, the Lovers, the Southern Gentlemen. As part of a behavioral experiment, an escape was facilitated from this asylum, and all of these infamous killers besieged the small town of Grace in what came to be called the Night of the Long Knives. The DRO was watching all of the carnage unfold. Razormouth managed to shock them by doing something entirely unexpected. After slaughtering some parents, the monster took an infant boy with him into the wilderness. The DRO kept tabs on him to watch him in the wild in his natural element, and they found that Razormouth cared for that baby. The monster kept the baby alive, safe, and to some repulsive degree, nourished. He was not, by any measuring stick, a good parent, but not through lack of effort, just capacity. When the DRO finally tired of study, they recaptured Razormouth and took him to Black Sight 1. There he was viciously tortured and experimented upon. But the most painful part of it was losing the baby. Around this time, John Sunday gets contacted by a DRO agent. This is out of the blue, but it's important because very few people on Earth 
have the influence to get the phone number of John Sunday. This agent cold calls him, says that there is going to be an incident at Black Site 1. John will receive a phone call from someone inside. If he decided to take this phone call and act upon it, then he would be given the chance to reclaim his pet and to humiliate the DRO in the process. Two weeks later, John gets the call and goes along with the plan. A pregnant woman named Cindy Jenkins orchestrates a massacre in Black Sight 1, using Razor Mouth as her weapon. After the brutal and bloody battle, Cindy and Razor Mouth emerge to find an army of the one true faith waiting for them. John Sunday was true to his word. He and Razor Mouth reunite. The monster goes to one knee in supplication to his creator. And all is right with the world. John Sunday can see that although this monster has evolved, it still knows its place. Razormouth and Cindy Jenkins were taken, at her request, to the entrance of a labyrinthian cave system where they disappeared under the earth. And then, for a long time, there was nothing. All was quiet. No one knew what happened down there. Until Razormouth returned at the battle. Ever since the massacre, the DRO prison and medical testing facility called Black Site 1 had sat empty. But just as soon as the sweep and suppress kill squad called Murder 2 arrived for a reconnaissance mission, they were beset. Horrific subterranean cannibal mutants dismantled the DRO soldiers. For many, many years, members of this hideous race had been captured and taken to Black Site 1 for medical experimentation. Now these creatures had come back for blood vengeance, and they were led by Razor Mouth. Now he wore a crown of bones, and these creatures worshipped him as their leader. King Razormouth set an example for the DRO. He stacked up enough bodies outside the prison doors so that he could spell out a warning for them to stay away, that this was his kingdom now. Word quickly got to John Sunday, who felt no small amount of pride at the handiwork of his creation. It was very soon after these events that John Sunday found a hidden alcove in the cult library. He discovered the secret history of the one true faith inside the handwritten journals of Jack the Ripper. The Ripper had established this cult based on visions from a long dead snake god called the Ophidian. Although John Sunday was at the height of his power, he could not help but to want and know more. He'd always been curious to a fault. He followed the information from the Ripper's journals out into the desert on a quest to find the final footsteps of the Ripper. John Sunday's journey 
took him to the mouth of a cave system, one that had been adorned with DRO corpses and messages in blood warning all to stay away by the command of King Razormouth. John Sunday's greatest leap of faith had taken him to the doorstep of his greatest creation.